um, I wanted to just um, thank everyone who has participated in our older adult training series. Um, we are, um, this will be our last session for 2021. And uh, it's just great to share it with all of you. Uh, we've appreciated your interest um, and we are um, happy to close out the year with you. Um, I'm going to actually, um, I think some of you know Cheryl Winter. Um, she is um, a senior program manager at CSH, uh, joined us uh, from, uh, I don't know, we, back east and uh, Chicago and all kinds of great places. Um, and we've been so happy to have her on our team. Um, so today we're gonna be really um, digging into CalAIM, a new Medi-Cal waiver program. Uh, and Cheryl will be giving you a lot of good tips for what it might mean for your clients. So with that, I will turn it over to Cheryl um, and uh, you take it away. <laughs> Great, thank you, Gretchen. Um, first of all, just thank you all for being here and starting your day um, with us. I was able to join a few of the um, prior trainings and discussions that you had together, um, but not all of the series. So I'm thankful that um, this session, like the others, are recorded, and we are working to make sure that we have links to all of the training series so that you can access and share with um, your staff. Um, particularly in conversations around CalAIM, there is guidance coming out, uh, well, monthly at least, if not uh, more often from the Department of Healthcare Services um, at the state level, and then there are many trainings and um, webinars that are being hosted by technical assistance providers, consultants that are being funded by foundations and a number of other um, groups, including the managed care plans themselves. So today we will be focusing on CalAIM, particularly enhanced care management and in lieu of services, which are now being called community supports and what they mean for your clients. So what might change, what new services are available and then what it means as a direct service provider. Um, we won't be going into as much detail around contracting or um, eligibility criteria or some of the um, components that are specific to each health plan. The plans are really working through that and presenting that material in writing and in contracting right now. Um, and so as we receive more information, um, that will be helpful to you. I'll continue to share it out. And so I'm thankful that we have this group and this email listserv. Um, so if you are interested in continuing to receive information, great. And if at any point you want us to take you off the list around CalAIM updates, please let me know because we can do that too. So today we'll be talking about what it means for your clients. Um, and I'm hoping we can use the chat and it's a small enough group. We're under hundred people right now. Um, that there is going to be an opportunity for discussions and questions. Um, but right now, just as we get to know each other, if you could in the chat, just put your name and the organization that you work for. And if you could say if your role is as a direct services provider or if you're in management of some kind at that agency, um, um, and then anything else about why you were interested in joining today's training. So we've got about 50 of us on the call right now, so I'll give it a minute uh, for you to put your name, agency, and if you're providing uh, direct services. I just want to get a sense of who is in, who is here today, and, um, and that way we can make sure we tailor our Q&A and have enough time. We have care coordinators, direct service providers, okay, some consulting. Great, Sam, welcome. Okay, some management, excellent, long-term services and supports. Wonderful, Scan Health Plan, welcome. City of Long Beach manager and provider, excellent, okay. Welcome, Aiko, good to see you, Kathy. Hi, Jean, welcome. My hope is that for today, I have a number of slides prepared. Um, we've got a lot of links, um, but I do hope we get um, into discussion around um, what else you are hearing and any questions that are coming up. What I'd like to do is to take this 
um, training and create a learner guide. And so if there are additional questions that come up, I'm sure there will be questions that I can't answer that others on the call may know the answer to, or there may be some that we just don't know the answers to yet. So we wanna be sure to get those to you um, as soon as we can. So we'll use the chat. Thank you for practicing using it right now and we're gonna get started. Okay, so this has been a multi-part series, so I'm not going to um, go into who CSH is um, as much as just some of the services that we provide and a little bit about my background. Um, so CSH, we are a national nonprofit. We also have local offices across the country and Los Angeles is one of those offices. So prior to joining CSHLA, I was working um, in our national consulting team, which worked across the US largely with states that were developing um, new healthcare services related to housing support. So related to housing navigation and tenancy sustaining services. And then also um, a lot of my consulting work was directly with provider organizations that were new to Medicaid. So looking to become uh, Medicaid or Medi-Cal providers and all of the new requirements and compliance and data and technology systems and, and how direct services change. So that's a little bit about my background. So I came from that consulting and training uh, background. Um, and before that, I was working as a direct service provider within a behavioral health service organization that used a housing first approach um, and worked primarily with older adults exiting chronic homelessness who had serious mental illness and substance use disorders co-occurring along with um, complex medical conditions. So this topic and um, the services we'll be talking about today are very near and dear to my heart and I am honored to be in the room with all of you. Thank you to those of you that have introduced yourself and if you're just joining us now, please use the chat and introduce yourself. Um, I wanna uh, go ahead and first ask a question to all of you. Um, we've been talking a, uh, a lot the last two years across the state, hearing about CalAIM, which is the California Advancing and Innovating Medi-Cal um, Innovation Waiver. So it's an 1115 waiver that allows the state to use this authority through the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid um, to adapt um, its Medi-Cal services and offer new benefits new services and also um, fold in some of the pilot programs like whole person care and health homes into statewide delivery of those services. So we'll be talking about CalAIM, but I'm curious, um, how would you describe CalAIM to a client? And this might be a trick question in terms of, would you even, <laughs> you know, how would you describe it and would you? So I'd let, I'd, I'm curious to hear, um, you know, summaries of CalAIM. We're going to get into details around enhanced care management and the community supports um, optional benefits, uh, optional services as well. I'm waiting to see in the chat if anyone wants to take a stab at describing CalAIM. And I said this is in part potentially a trick question because I think when we talk about services and benefits, there's also then the administration of those benefits and how they are funded and what new you know, um, data requirements might be or um, all of that administrative stuff that goes on in the back end. And when I think about CalAIM, I think about it being a way to reform and innovate how the state provides Medi-Cal services and an acknowledgement at the state level that social determinants of health, things like housing, food security, um, remaining in home, in community, and having um, assistance with coordinating across all of the different providers are, are essential. These are going to be statewide um, services. Some of them right now are optional um, and the state has made it clear that CalAIM, the intent is to take what was learned from whole person care and health homes and fold it in across the state. So in Los Angeles, whole person care and health homes were a part of our county, um, but in some counties um, they didn't have either. In others they may have had one of those programs but not both. 
And so this is an opportunity for the state to use managed care, um, Medi-Cal health insurance programs to implement these social services. Um, there are target populations that CalAIM prioritizes. And so we'll be talking about um, those target populations in a little bit more detail and how the state plans to roll out um, serving those target populations and the timeline for that. Um, and there are a number of um, new ways that the state is paying for or increasing flexibility to, to incentivize um, and build provider capacity. So many of you have been advocating for a benefit at the state level um, that would be for housing related services and support. And CalAIM gets us one step closer to that in that it is beginning to grow the network of providers across the state that can, um, that weren't, you know, previously weren't enrolled as Medi-Cal providers, um, but were providing essential community services, particularly those related to housing support, um, food security, uh, medically tailored meals. Um, and now these are providers that can be in network contracted with the various health plans across their county. I have this slide twice in the, in the deck because I'm going to be referring to a number of existing um, documents, websites. Um, some are directly from the Department of Healthcare Services. There, there was new guidance that came out just yesterday related to data requirements. Um, last month, we had more guidance coming out related to payment. Um, so there, there are regular updates coming out from the state, but then there are also a, a number of publications that help to explain CalAIM. So I'm hoping that in today's um, presentation and discussion, we'll be able to focus primarily on how CalAIM and enhanced care management and community supports impact your clients um, and impact you as direct service providers. Um, Please send any questions into the chat. And if we don't get to those questions, we'll make sure to include them. And we are recording today's session. So just an overview of how CalAIM is going to be changing the delivery system um, and reforming how uh, providers are paid for services. Um, the goal is that CalAIM would come at its services through a whole person care approach, looking at the social determinants of health. Um, the health homes program and whole person care both included um, components of care coordination, um, coordinating across providers for services, inclusion of some housing related services. Um, and those are being folded in to enhanced care management and then the community supports and incentive payments. There are a number of other reforms that are happening with CalAIM, so it's much, much bigger than enhanced care management and community support. So I've listed some of those proposals, um, but today we're going to be focusing on enhanced care management and community support. Another poll to the group. Um, yes, Victoria, I will send the PowerPoint to attendees. Great question, thank you. Um, I also would like to turn the PowerPoint into a learner guide so that we can include any questions that came um, and additional resources um, because they are <laughs> coming out. Um, some is as late as yesterday um, being released. So there is uh, ongoing guidance. So yes, we will send this PowerPoint out. In the chat, if you could tell us, is your organization in process to become an enhanced care management or community supports provider? love to see if you are in process right now and if not we'll talk about um, what these changes might mean for your clients and and why you may be interested um, in looking into the provider certification processes with the health plans um, since there is a rolling um, application process very in process anyone else right now considering becoming an enhanced care management provider or a community supports provider Processing considering. Yes, Christine, I hear you about the compensation rates. I think it's very wise to be um, 
if you're not already a Medi-Cal provider and don't already have all of the systems in place, it makes sense to be considering what the real cost will be for your startup. And the plans do have incentive um, dollars, um, some of which they need to. So they are, um, there are certain percentages of those incentive payments that are coming from the state to plans that the plans need to pass on for capacity building directly to providers. And then there is a 30% of the incentive payments where plans have a choice of how they're going to use those. So um, not in a formal process, looking for more information, great. Thank you, Andrea. Okay, so just again, just this high, last of the high level slides, some of the big picture changes in the landscape um, that we're seeing is for your clients, we are seeing that there are some new services um, that are offered, um, some new eligible populations for those services. Some of the services are optional for health plans to include, um, but we'll talk about the um, services that all of the Los Angeles health plans have decided to include. They coordinated together and did an excellent job coordinating across all plans um, to be really intentional about, intentional about including housing related services uh, for their members. Um, and rolling those out in January of 2022. Um, there are also the opportunities for additional providers to refer to services. So a member can self-refer and say, I think I'm eligible for enhanced care management, or I think I'm eligible for community supports. A provider like yourself um, could fill out a referral form or make a call to a plan. Um, so there are additional opportunities there for your clients to be referred to services. Because um, there is new eligibility criteria and there are um, mechanisms that the plans have had to put in place to identify the highest acuity or highest need members, um, there will be new assessments and eligibility criteria. So for your clients, that may mean a new assessment process. Um, it may mean that they are assigned a um, new care manager if they are eligible for enhanced care management and your organization is not providing it. So we'll talk about what that might look like. Um, there are some new provisions um, around and new guidance from the state around what care transitions look like and what types of formal partnerships um, providers that are providing enhanced care management need to have in place and the formal processes that manage care um, need to have in place in terms of contracting and payment of community support providers. So for your clients, um, it's going to be very important that they are enrolled in Medi-Cal managed care because all of these services are coming through Medi-Cal Medi managed care, so not through the fee-for-service option. Um, for your providers, um, those of you that are considering or are currently in a contracting process, there will be changes related to um, how you are reimbursed, the frequency of that reimbursement and the types of documentation that need to be submitted and what's considered accurate or a clean claim uh, to be reimbursed. So that will mean changes in, in how you document your services, what forms you use, how you submit them for payment. Um, there could be additional contracts and partnerships that you'll be building. Um, you may be asked to come into care planning meetings uh, with an enhanced care management provider um, or be asked to join care planning meetings with the community supports provider um, because this care coordination really seeks to be inclusive of all members of a, a person's care team. So all of the different providers, um, whether they be behavioral health, long-term services and supports, services for older adults, um, primary care, all of that um, is going to be included, all of those members in this whole person approach. And then I think one other um, additional piece, and this is related to that first bullet in the changes in documentation, but services that are provided by a Medi-Cal managed care, funded by Medi-Cal, um, are a part of a client's medical record. And so there are changes in terms of how records are stored, what um, privacy um, regulations you will have to adhere to, um, and then the members' rights in terms of accessing their um, service records and documentation because it is now a part of their medical record. 
I think, and the exciting <laughs> news and what this means for healthcare, um, I think there are opportunities and challenges and things we wanna just be mindful of for all of our organizations, um, particularly those that really um, grew up in a grassroots community-based approach um, that have tremendous flexibility right now in how you provide services and um, how you make ends meet. Um, there is a shift in the landscape and we've been seeing this shift for about the last 10 years or so where states are more and more choosing to pay for housing related services and supports and services related to the social determinants of health. And so there's a shift in how organizations are funded, but there's also a shift in that professionalization of the field. Um, and so particularly for community-based providers um, that may have not been able to be competitive in terms of salaries and benefits, there are opportunities in that professionalization in contracting with managed care that you'll be able to negotiate in an ideal world, able to negotiate rates that could potentially um, increase wages, support staff salaries, um, pay for training um, and professional development. Um, the, there are also challenges with that because there's also additional administrative burden um, in being a healthcare provider, right? There's a lot more documentation and, and a lot of compliance and, and likely um, compliance to multiple different funders. Um, I think there is um, an exciting prospect for us as providers to become part of these managed care provider networks um, to get access to, um, health information, when you are a part of a healthcare provider network, you have access to data that otherwise would have been considered protected or private health information, but as a healthcare provider, you then are a part of that covered entity network um, that is under HIPAA. So there are some additional access opportunities in terms of understanding the services um, and health care needs of your, the people you're serving. Pat, excellent question. How many managed care agencies are connected to Cal AIM? We will get into that in a minute um, as we talk about enhanced care management and the community supports and which of the Los Angeles um, managed care plans are offering which optional services. So thank you for that question. And, uh, and I have a few slides on that. So I'm going to start by describing and talking a little bit about enhanced care management and what it means for your clients. Um, in terms of who is eligible, who are the target populations, what the process might look like or feel like. Um, and I would love to hear in the chat, um, you know, how does this differ for, um, for members that might be whole person care members? We're gonna talk a little bit about what that means for those members right now um, and what that means in 2022 and potentially 2023 as the county shifts from being the, you know, administering whole person care to um, to handing it over to Medi-Cal managed care. So when the enhanced care management benefit is designated as um, meant to serve individual members, so Medi-Cal members who have the highest um, need, um, the highest acuity, and for these seven target populations. Um, these target populations are going to be folded in over time. And so um, we will talk a little bit about uh, who, who the plans will be, begin serving January 1st, 2022, and which of the people that you work with um, could be eligible for enhanced care management right away, and who might be folded in over time. Um, this is you know, a new way of delivering services for the plans. And so, and there are a lot of new requirements. So they have um, a period of time to roll out um, these services to different target populations. I want to highlight this one to three percent. So for the highest acuity members, um, this enhanced care management benefit is a care coordination benefit. So it's a coordination of services where um, a member would have a lead care manager that is you know, a staff member at an enhanced care management provider agency 
that agency will be contracted with one or more managed care plans. And then that lead care manager will be responsible for coordinating the care for, for that member. And it really, I, I want to stress this highest acuity members piece because the plans, the way that the plans are being paid by the state, by DHCS, they are not getting an additional dollar amount for each person that they enroll in enhanced care management. Um, they are instead being paid a capitation rate, meaning you know, a, a dollar amount for each one of their members served overall across the county. And that dollar amount is going to go up slightly. And what the plans are then responsible to do is determine what is their eligibility criteria and what types of acuity, you know, what diagnoses, what um, service utilization do they need to look at to decide, hey, we can cover the cost for coordinating care for these specific members that have the most acute needs, the, the most severe needs, um, because we know that it will be cost effective and it's the type of care that they need to be able to remain in the community. So the eligibility criteria um, for enhanced care management, let me go back here and just highlight that individuals experiencing chronic homelessness or homelessness um, are eligible for enhanced care management. And I apologize, this um, has changed. So as guidance has come out from the state, it is no longer for individuals who are at risk of becoming homeless. So I, I apologize and I will correct that slide before sending these out. Um, CMS and the Department of Healthcare Services have approved use of the HUD defini definition of homelessness um, with some modifications. And so um, this information was taken from the DHCS website um, I will. I have included the link. So on this next page, um, the key design implementation decisions uh, slides that this was taken from those and from um, the policy manuals for the enhanced care management. Um, so it is individuals experiencing homelessness. It can be the HUD definition. Um, it can also be for individuals that are exiting an institution if they were considered homeless. Um, immediately prior to entering the institutional stay, regardless of the length of time in an institution. So I think what, what's important here is that sometimes that HUD definition um, of homelessness keeps people who have been in a nursing um, care facility or hospitalized for over 90 days, it, it keeps them out of that consideration of um, experiencing homelessness. And um, this modification to the definition would allow for anyone that went into an institution um, unhoused, they would then, you know, no matter how long they stayed in that institution, um, it could be a jail, it could be a long-term care facility, you know, if they entered and they were unhoused, then they would um, be considered um, eligible under this definition of homelessness. The person also must have at least one complex physical, behavioral, or developmental health need. Um, in addition to that, I want to highlight this, um, this piece around the highest acuity members. So um, these target populations are mandatory. And so this, this could be a lot of people. And so that is why the plans have reiterated um, you know, to providers that it really is going to be probably that top one to 3%, um, which that information differs slightly from information um, that the state had said um, in terms of who would be eligible. I see I have a number of questions coming in, so I'm gonna do my best to address them. And then we do have some time reserved for questions as well. Um, okay. So, uh, uh, Lana, thank you. It is likely that significant numbers of people currently enrolled in whole person care and health homes program will not be eligible for enhanced care management. Are the health plans responsible for finding alternative services for these individuals? That's an excellent question. So actually the um, county recently did, um, the Department of Health Services recently put on a uh, webinar where they explained um, in collaboration with the plans um, I think there was uh, a lead member from the safety net initiatives at LA Care that co-presented um, with Clemens Hong on 
um, the transition from whole person care to enhanced care management, that it is likely that not everyone will be, um, be eligible for enhanced care management. That being said, um, everyone from whole person care will be transitioned into enhanced care management initially, and then the plans will need to reassess for eligibility. So this will take some time. So initially everyone will be grandfathered in, and then there will be a period of time when the health plans in that first year will be doing reassessments of eligibility. Um, LA County has said um, to the Department of Health Services that they will, um, for some members who are right now enrolled in whole person care, that they, the county will be covering the costs for those members who aren't eligible for enhanced care management to continue receiving those care coordination services. What that will look like uh, we, I would want someone from the Department of Health Services to, to be presenting on that. So um, for the purpose of today's webinar on you know, what this means for your clients, um, what I can say is that we know that those that are a part of whole person care will be transitioned into enhanced care management. They will be reassessed. That reassessment will include um, looking at different social determinants of health and determining if someone is eligible to receive a community support. So if they have housing needs, um, you know, would they be eligible at that point of reassessment? Even if they may not meet the criteria for enhanced care management, maybe they might meet criteria for other community support. Um, I do have in the resources page, um, a link to a training that happened at the end of October that was exactly about that transition from whole person care and health homes to um, enhanced care management and community supports. And it was, um, it's, the link and the recording are, are both available. So I have made those both available. So it's a great question, Alana, thank you. Um, if you have a member or you're working with someone that meets this eligibility criteria for enhanced care management, there are clarifications uh, from the state on um, that there are certain waiver programs that someone cannot be enrolled in um, the assisted living waiver, for instance, and enhanced care management. Um, the slides 19 through 22 and this link here um, of the key design implementation decisions, the Department of Healthcare Services goes through and lists the different waiver programs that make someone not eligible for enhanced care management. And then they also give explanation around dual eligible, so people that have both Medicare and Medi-Cal um, those that um, there are there are a few other programs where um, if enrolled in managed care and enhanced care management, a member can also be receiving some of these other programs. But I wanted to call out these uh, six waiver programs here to just highlight that if you are working with clients that are part of one of these waiver programs, they will not be. Um, put into enhanced care management. They will. They cannot be enrolled in both at the same time. And look back at the chat. Um, Gary, I'm going to address your question um, in just one minute. So I'll first talk a little bit about the rollout. So as I mentioned, this is um, you know Cal Aim is going to be rolled out over the next few years. And the state will be evaluating data as it comes in related to, you know, were their predictions right about cost effectiveness and, and um, covering social determinants of health um, and needs like housing related services, you know, for members experiencing homelessness, does, does that save the state money? Um, does that enable them to be more flexible with um, how they fund social determinants of health? So, over time, these different populations for enhanced care management will be rolled out. In Los Angeles County, because we had whole person care and health, health homes, um, it will be beginning in January 2022 in counties where they did not have whole person care and health homes. Um, the start date for enhanced care management will be in July of 2022. Um, then in January of 2023 and July of 2023, there are some other um, populations that will be added in or rolled into enhanced care management, but it's beginning with individuals and families experiencing homelessness, 
adult high utilizers. Um, and those definitions of high utilizers are in the key um, decisions and some of the documents that are in the resources page uh, for you. And then adults with serious mental illness, substance use disorders, um, or co-occurring. The, um, if someone is at risk of institutionalization, um, this, those individuals at risk of institutionalization with SMI or SUD with co-occurring chronic health conditions, they will be eligible for enhanced care management. So just in looking at this um, list, many of you that are serving older adults, um, thinking about individuals transitioning back to the communities um, who are involved in the justice system, um, the eligibility for enhanced care management for those individuals will begin in January 2023. Um, right now, if you are working with individuals that are exiting uh, institutions um, that are justice involved, um, the health plans are required to do screenings and to enroll people um, exiting um, the justice system into Medi-Cal um, and to do those assessments as they exit um, jail or prison um, to assess for community support. So if someone needs those housing related supports or medically tailored meals um, and, and to make sure that they are enrolled in Medi-Cal. However, enhanced care management um, will be available to those individuals beginning in January, 2023. If they meet one of the definitions for the other, <laughs> you know, experiencing homelessness or they're a high utilizer, then they, they, they may be able to be eligible in January, 2022. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the questions. So if an individual refuses any type of health services, will this impact their ability to receive homeless housing services funded through CalAIM? That's a great question, Sherry. So um, any Medi-Cal service can be declined by a member um, at any point. Someone can say, yes, I want to be referred to enhanced care management and or referred to a community supports like a housing, um, housing navigation or tenancy sustaining services. And then when they get to the assessment, they could say, no, I don't want this. Um, they could um, make it through the assessment, start the care planning process and then decline services. So at any point, a member a, you know, Medicaid, Medi-Cal member has the right to decline services. I would say that um, one of the biggest reasons that the um, that managed care looks to contracting with community support providers or with providers that work in the community is because of the connections that we have in terms of how we engage with people experiencing homelessness, how assertive and proactive um, and tenacious <laughs> Um, we are, and that outreach component and really being able to explain what the benefits might be of those services is going to be really important in helping people understand why they might want to go through this process of being referred for something, having an assessment done, um, sitting in a care planning meeting um, in order to have care coordinated and, and to meet their health care needs. Enhanced care management is uh, I would say it's a robust in-person care coordination uh, service. So it is a benefit. So when the plans determine who is eligible, they are having to set that acuity, um, those acuity levels pretty high because as a benefit, anyone that meets the eligibility criteria that a plan sets, um, the plan needs to offer those services to that person. So enhanced care management is a benefit, meaning people, it's an entitlement that people have a right to if they're eligible. Community supports, on the other hand, these are optional services that managed care plans can choose to provide. Um, once they set the eligibility criteria, they do need to offer them, but they are not considered a benefit or an entitlement. So at any point, the state could change, you know, things could change um, and, uh, it's not considered something that is guaranteed as a benefit. An enhanced care management service provider um, could be assigned, you, you know, you might be working with a client that is assigned to enhanced care management provider. And so they may now have a new lead care manager um, that is reaching out to them to do an assessment. 
if you are not looking to provide community supports or to be an enhanced care management provider, uh, you still very much uh, have a role to play in supporting uh, your clients, largely in that assessment process, in that care planning process, in coordinating appointments and care. Um, you can be involved to as, you know, as much a degree as um, the client wants you to be included. I would say that it, it can be very helpful for you to be included in those care planning processes, um, in the assessment process. You can be a referrer. So anyone that you're working with that you think might be eligible, there might be a chance that they could meet that high acuity. Um, you don't need to decide that, right? You can make, make the referral and, and then the managed care plan is going to be um, responsible for overseeing some, that someone do the assessment. Um, the enhanced care management provider is going to receive information from managed care plans related to the other providers that this member is receiving care from. So uh, if a client has um, is assigned to enhanced care management and has a lead care manager, that lead care manager will then uh, learn from a managed care plan who the primary care provider is, if that person has received any behavioral health services, who the, who the contact information is for any specialty care providers, um, ideally, they would receive information about any older adult services or homeless services provided if the plan has access to that data. Um, so that then that lead care manager can bring everyone together related to care planning. It also um, a responsibility of that lead care manager is to support during care transitions. So if a member is hospitalized, a plan will notify the enhanced care management provider about that hospitalization or institutionalization. And when that member is going to transition back home, um, that lead care manager is going to be responsible for supporting with that transition, making sure that all of the providers that are, are working with that member are aware of the transition and that they update the assessment uh, and care plan to reflect any changes in needs or services um, after that institutional stay. At the assessment point, um, a member might be assessed and assessed to no longer need enhanced care management. And so then the enhanced care management provider is also responsible for having a plan in place for how they transition someone off of their enhanced care management caseload. So termination or graduation. So termination could be a member says, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> um, or it could be um, that they no longer meet the acuity level criteria, um, and so they no longer are eligible for enhanced care management. If that is the case, your role as, as having being a part of that warm handoff or transition um, is going to be really important as well. So I, I think even if you're not right now considering providing enhanced care management as a provider, know that many of the people you're working with may be eligible. Um, particularly those that meet that high acuity criteria that have complex care needs and um, you know, serious mental illness and are experiencing homelessness. I'm look back at the questions. Internal referrals for individuals. Yes, yes, so you will be able to do referrals for individuals to participate in enhanced care management. Um, those referrals are going to go it will be very important that you are keeping track of which health plan that client is enrolled in because the referral process um, could look different for each health plan. Okay. So ECM is a Medi-Cal benefit. It is intended to be a comprehensive care management approach and it's intended to be community-based. So a provider um, that provides in-person services in the community, meeting people where they are at, is going to um, be a strong candidate for providing enhanced care management because enhanced care management is seen as um, the highest level of care coordination that someone might need. So being able to meet people where they are at, being able to provide transportation to and from non-medical appointments, um, things like um, things that are in community services, meeting folks where they're at is go are going to be really important. 
um, the um, lead care manager is going to be a part of a multidisciplinary care team. And I think one thing that, um, you know, as you are coordinating with enhanced care management providers, it will be important that you think about what you need as an organization in order to provide that care coordination, in order to join care planning meetings. Do you have funding to cover your staff time to join those meetings? Is that already a part of your responsibilities? Or would that mean that you would want to negotiate something in a formal contract in terms of some, some kind of uh, reimbursement for participating in care planning? The lead care manager is also going to be responsible for coordinating community support. So if you're not an enhanced care management provider, um, but you are working with clients that may be eligible for community support, um, that lead care manager is going to be coordinating with you. So if you're interested in um, contracting with a managed care plan or multiple plans for providing any of the housing related services, um, housing deposits, uh, any of the um, community supports, um, that lead care manager will also need to be in coordination with you and the enhanced care management provider is expected to have formal contracts in place. Um, Providers of enhanced care management and providers of community supports are going to be required to have a national provider identification number, identifier number, it's called an NPI. This is something that's required across the country for anyone that is a Medicaid provider. Um, I think this is the first step. If you are thinking about, um, <laughs> thinking about contracting or thinking about wanting to provide these services at some point in the future, uh, getting started on NPI, um, getting your national provider identifier number is going to be a good first step. And on September 29th, DHCS released guidance um, that was called the National Provider Identifier Application Guidance. And so I've included that link as well um, in the resources page. Okay, I want to ask all of you, um, since we have a, a mix of folks on the line, those that are providing services directly, uh, those that are, um, we have some health plans on the line, we have some consultants on the line, I'm curious what you are hearing about whole person care enrollees, and if you have anything that you'd want to add um, to the information I shared. Um, you know, DHC, DHCS's vision is that enhanced care management and community supports build upon uh, the whole person care pilots and the health home program pilot, um, and they want to make it statewide. So the intent is, is not to leave anyone behind. I think the challenge here is ensuring that it can go statewide while still um, providing a high level of care coordination. And so the eligibility criteria may be moving to a more acute um, subgroup of people. Um, we have heard again from uh, the county that there may be some members who are on whole person care right now that at, when it ends December 31st uh, of this year um, that the county would continue to pay for those services even if the person is not eligible um, for enhanced care management but it will take some time for plans. Want to be seamless transition from county to health plans. Anyone else have anything that they wanted to share of what they're hearing about what this means for your clients who are right now enrolled in whole person care? If you're looking to Google for the um, whole person care uh, webinar, there was a webinar called whole, whole person care and health homes program transition public webinar and it was provided on September 21st of this year. Uh, I also have included that link in the resources page. We're gonna transition now away from what enhanced care management might look like for your clients to talking about community supports. So community supports were previously called ILOS or in lieu of services. Um, the name was changed to community supports in order to better reflect uh, the intention of um, DHCS and in wanting to 
acknowledge the role of community providers and acknowledge the importance of the social determinants of health in uh, Medi-Cal members' well-being. Uh, also, the term community supports has been used by a number of states that did add housing-related services as a benefit. So if the state wanted to transition from community supports being an optional service that plans could choose to offer, um, if they want to transition that into something that is a statewide benefit, you know, in a few years after they've seen some good, you know, I knock on wood, some good evaluation data, um, community supports is a term that's been used and accepted by the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare um, as the term that's appropriate for these services. Um, and there are billing codes that go along with it. There are 14 services that health plans can choose from. And so I'm going to, um, in a minute, show the, the services that right now the Los Angeles County plans have uh, committed to providing in January of 2022. Um, but it is important to point out that plans are able to add to their community support services um, every six months. They, they have the option to enroll providers over time. So um, if you're right now still just feeling out if you wanna provide community support, great, it's not too late. Um, and you know, over time plans may be continuing to add to their provider networks, um, grow their capacity building and support for providers that may need a little bit more support um, in making that leap to becoming um, HIPAA compliant and having the right data systems in place. It used to be called in lieu of services because um, these optional services are um, required to have a cost-effective component. So a Medi-Cal managed care plan can choose to provide community supports to someone if they have certain medical needs and it's more cost effective to provide a community support from this list rather than a more ex expensive uh, medical service. So community support um, could be a housing deposit um, that a plan pays for, you know, a security deposit or, um, you know, moving costs rather than keeping someone in a hospital overnight stay where they no longer need that level of care. Um, it could also be um, that a plan would pay for recuperative care, um, a recuperative care stay or bed um, in place of, in lieu of um, discharging someone to a nursing facility or keeping someone in the hospital. So the term in lieu of was originally to, to demonstrate this um, intent around it needs to be cost effective because um, once a plan commits to serving a certain target population, they're going to be held to that, um, but they're not getting more money for each person that they enroll in community supports. It really needs to show that it's cost neutral. The beautiful thing is that we know um, that over time, housing services, housing related services are cost neutral. Um, when they are paired with housing. And so I think there is an advocacy opportunity for us as providers to keep um, working on how we align services with housing, um, because it is that housing where we see people's health really improve and where that evalu evaluation data will come out strong is if someone gets housing, um, then we see their health um, outcomes beginning to improve and we see costs going down. So who is eligible for community supports? Um, this is determined by the plan and it um, must be cost effective. It must be medically appropriate. Um, the plans will determine what cost effective means. So um, that could mean that there are several different definitions of what cost effective means and several def different definitions of eligibility for community supports. The plans are highly encouraged to coordinate and thankfully uh, in LA that has happened and is continuing to happen. Um, and so we saw, you know, of those 14 community supports that plans could choose to add, um, these are the supports that right now have been communicated to us that will be provided 
in January, starting in January 2022. That's not to say that at some point Anthem or HealthNet or any of the plans might choose to add another one um, that right now doesn't have an X on it. But I highlighted the four services that all of the Los Angeles plans have said they want to um, provide. Housing, tenancy, and sustaining services. So everything that once someone is in housing can help them to address barriers to remaining housed, um, to address crises, to, to support in um, navigating repairs and communication with property management and landlords and um, housing recertification and all of the services that help someone stay housed. All of the plans have committed to providing that. Housing transition navigation services. Again, all of the plans have committed to um, providing um, funding for, again, members that meet that cost effectiveness and medical necessity criteria. Um, but those housing transition and navigation services include many of the services that all of you as housers are already providing. Um, medically tailored meals, all um, six plans have agreed to cover or include in community supports and then recuperative care, so medical respite. Um, again, all, all six plans have said that they will include these community supports. Thank you, Aiko, for adding in about SCAN. That's great. I, I realize I may have muted myself unintentionally, so <laughs> um, I hope everyone can hear me now. I'm not sure how long I was talking muted. Okay, um, so these other services, housing deposits, you can see Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield Promise both said that they um, would add those. That's not to say that others may not. Over time, the plans will have opportunities to keep adding community supports. Um, or to make changes to their community supports. But I wanna, in um, our last uh, 30 minutes together, have some discussion around the housing tenancy and sustaining services and housing transition navigation services. So I'm gonna briefly review what they include. And then um, I wanna have some discussion around you know, how is this different from what you're providing right now? Um, do we have a sense of how many clients you're serving right now might be eligible for these services? Um, and then what can you do if you're not looking to be an enhanced care management or community supports provider? How can you still support your clients? Okay. So the Department of Healthcare Services has outlined, you know, under each of these community supports, there are specific activities that um, are permissible. And so this housing transition navigation services um, includes these 14 uh, or 15 services. And I wanted to give you a minute to read. You might have to um, you know, go full screen so you can read this, um, but give you a minute to read this and see if there's anything right now, if you are a homeless services agency, anything related to housing navigation that you're doing right now that's not on this list. And I'll give you a hint, there is at least one thing <laughs> for most organizations. Um, but I included this list of 15 services because I wanted you to see, you know, that the state is really taking it seriously that, you know, housing transition and navigation needs to include things like helping someone to complete housing applications, helping them to get the right documentation that they need. And that could involve driving someone to social security office, you know, getting their birth certificate, um, looking up their previous rental history if they have one, if they have that, um, identifying and braiding resources. So identifying if someone is eligible for um, any uh, coordinated entry, you know, if, if they are eligible for housing and coming up on the list uh, soon, making sure to identify those resources um, and align them. And then also thinking about any um, additional moving costs. So, you know, two of the plans said that they will um, include housing deposits. Uh, we don't know the eligibility criteria necessarily necessarily for who would be eligible for housing deposits. But part of this navigation service is also navigating all of the different funding streams. And so that's something that uh, many of us already do. Um, 
one thing that is not on here that I do want to point out is outreach. So the times when you are going to meet a member, uh, meet a client who is maybe living on the street or in a shelter, um, and maybe you go to find them and they're not there. Um, you know, some of that outreach time, that is not listed here, but it's not to say that it's not important. And so if you are looking to provide housing transition and navigation services, I'd wanna make sure to encourage you that your contracts include all of these services and that you talk about the role of outreach and assertive engagement um, in providing housing navigation services. Housing tenancy and sustaining services. There are 13 um, services here. Uh, it is really intended to help um, a member in identifying any barriers for remaining, you know, any behaviors that might jeopardize housing, any um, training on their rights and responsibilities as a tenant, um, on the roles that um, a landlord and property manager can play in, in helping to maintain tenancy and how to develop those relationships. And then also assisting with all of the different um, community resources. So with benefits, with recertification, with um, continuing to um, work on the individual's housing crisis plan. Um, these are all a part of this housing tenancy and sustaining services. I have not heard in LA County about any plans saying we'll pay for um, numbers one, seven, and 12, but not the others. Um, but I have heard that in some other counties. So just something to be mindful of that, you know, for your clients, we really want, if someone is eligible to receive housing tenancy and sustaining services, we want to ensure that they are eligible to receive all 13 of these services and not just a handful of them. So who can make referrals? You can, the member can, any other provider organization can, the managed care plan can. Um, so, so this again varies by plan. So I do have contact information um, for the different plans so that you can make sure you have the right referral forms, um, the right information, and that if you're interested in becoming a provider um, or learning more that you could get in contact with them. So if you are wanting to become a provider or to reach out to the plans, um, there was a webinar held on August 9th um, that was put on together by all of the plans in Los Angeles. And um, so here is contact information. You'll see that this in lieu of services, which is now called Community Supports, um, the plans came together to create one application for provider certification, which is the process that you, um, a provider has to go through to um, become a Medicaid provider. They have to be certified by a health plan. And they decided to use the same certification tool. So they coordinated together, um, but that tool, um, after it's completed, needs to be sent to each plan individually, and then each plan will communicate with you about a contract and any feedback they might have. So it, um, the plans are working to coordinate together, um, and I'll say that this um, deadline of Friday, September 3rd, this was for community support providers that would want to go live providing services in January 2022. Um, that said, I have heard from all of the plans that they are interested in growing their networks and that they may add additional services or additional providers. So if you're interested, um, it is worth reaching out. Yes, and kudos to the plans for coordinating and streamlining the process. I, I have to say there's so much new guidance coming out from the state and the plans have to re react really quickly. And so there's a lot, it's a lot right now happening. And um, I am comforted by the fact of this sort of slower rollout um, through 2022 and 2023. Okay, we're gonna get into discussion. Um, and thank you, Eiko, for updating on SCAN. Um, we'll start serving in January 2022 as well. And I will update my slides um, before I send it out to the group to include that information. That's really helpful. Um, there are opportunities and challenges that we're seeing with community supports. And so how that impacts 
uh, your clients. Um, it could impact your clients in terms of caseload sizes. So we are seeing that um, while individuals that are being deemed eligible for community supports and for enhanced care management have the highest acuity levels in terms of the intensity of services and, and how they are provided, um, the caseload sizes that we're seeing in terms of the rates and what type of staff they would cover are um, less than ideal, I'd say. So, you know, oftentimes we know in housing related supports, uh, tenancy supports a caseload of one housing case manager to 20 clients is considered standard for ICMS in LA, um, for um, clients with co-occurring behavioral health conditions, serious mental illness, oftentimes evidence points to a caseload size of one to 10 clients. Uh, and what we're seeing is that many of the contracts are saying something more like one to 35 or one to 40. Um, and, and that's partly because um, of the way this rate structure has been presented. I will say that there are incentive dollars that the plans will need to pass on related to capacity building. Some relate, could be related to startup costs. And then I think also making the case in your contracting conversations around why um, smaller caseload sizes will help you to, will help the client's health. <laughs> so why will it have a direct impact on the outcomes? Um, what, why do your staff need these smaller caseloads to really be able to provide these intensive services is going to be really important. I, I'd say another um, key challenge that I want to highlight is that um, we know as partners who work it, uh, with older adults and in housing that it is the access to housing and the stability and foundation that housing provides that helps people to then address other healthcare concerns and helps people to stabilize. And so if these services are paid for and provided and housing is not aligned, we run the risk of having faulty evaluation data um, that says, oh, we provided these services and uh, people's health didn't improve. So it's going to be really important that housing providers and that data related to someone's housing status is shared with the plans so that plans can say, you know, pre-housing, this was the cost and these were people's health outcomes and post-housing, these are the changes we saw. So that's something that DHCS hasn't required that plans track, um, but is something that I just want to encourage all of you to be coordinating, you know, as you're talking about care planning, as much as you can then um, coordinate around ensuring that all providers are aware of when someone, you know, achieved housing or, or you know, moves into housing, um, interim or permanent, um, and that that goes into that medical record and is being tracked in some way so that we can start to make the case for a benefit will be really important. Okay. Some are not specifying caseloads but aren't providing compensation that allows for smaller caseloads. Thank you, Christine, yes. Um, yes, I, I'd say in thinking about how plans are reimbursing for these services. We are seeing variation across the state. Some are choosing to say, um, we'll pay you for each person that you're serving uh, per month. So a per member per month rate. Others are saying it will be per day that you provided that service. Others are saying it might be a fee for service model. Um, and I think providers have questions around, will they be guaranteed referrals? So how, you know, and will we be guaranteed a certain duration of services at a minimum? You know, if you, if you say you're gonna contract with me to provide tenancy sustaining services, um, will I know that, that those referrals will be for at least three months or six months or 18 months? <laughs> how long will services be provided and can I be guaranteed that my staff will get new referrals in as their caseloads change? Um, these are all questions that right now are, are very much on providers' minds in contracting and that um, plans and providers are having to work out. Um, housing for Health ICMS provider contracts, DHS is working um, um, deliberately with the managed care organizations uh, related to those existing members. And so um, 
providers who are ICMS contract providers will have the opportunity to be subcontracted. So DHS will have a contract with each managed care plan in addition to, and then could subcontract to ICMS providers, um, in addition to any provider having the opportunity to contract directly with the managed care plan. Um, the county will cover costs, as I said, for whole person care and relays that aren't eligible for ECM in 2022. I have not heard the um, eligibility criteria or any timeline in terms of for how long that will be and is it for everyone or some of the folks that run whole person care and how that will be rolled out. Um, but that has been um, talked about and is being thought about. Um, we are seeing that providers that have the capacity to do both community supports and enhanced care management are those that right now are most likely to contract with plans. Um, and uh, there are concerns around startup costs. And so I, I think when we talk about what the total cost of care is, um, we also want to be thinking about what does it cost to hire staff that you may not get reimbursement for for several months. So do you have a line of credit to pay for staff salaries or who is covering those startup costs? Can it be a loan from the managed care plan or um, can that be part of the incentive payments? Um, there are a number of questions that remain related to that. Okay, so moving on to the discussion and questions. Um, there are a few things that I mentioned that you can do, even if you aren't an enhanced care management provider or community supports provider. So referrals, <laughs> um, ensuring that you are connected to those providers that are enhanced care management providers um, so that you can be a part of the care planning process, um, that you can understand the referral process. Uh, if you are thinking about contracting, looking into getting an NPI number now. Um, and then ensuring that um, there, is, uh, there are opportunities for data sharing related to housing status. So advocating for that if you're a homeless service provider um, is going to be really important for the plans in terms of tracking outcomes. So I love the questions coming in. I wanna open it up for questions and also just um, I'd love to hear from you what resonated, what additional questions you might have. And then if you want to answer um, this you know, question around what role is your organization playing in the rollout and provider services or what you are seeing and hearing, I would love for this um, last 15 minutes to just be a time of sharing so that we can make sure we all um, have the same information since there's so much going on. Are we? Uh, Go ahead, you're on. Okay. Um, well, Helping Hand Senior Foundation, uh, you know, we're not in HMIS. Uh, we're basically uh, care coordination. I mean, a client calls and they want information on all the important subjects you touch on, housing, food, transportation, health. Um, so I prepare a list of resources for our care coordinators. So um, I was very pleased to, to see this uh, presentation. I don't know how quite, I mean, we've referred to, I mean, obviously, um, I'm not sure yet how we can absorb all this as it rolls out, but yes. uh, thank you for yes, this. Thank you. And I, and I do wanna say, you know, the resources, there's a lot on DHCS's website, but there are um, a number of um, technical assistance providers and um, consulting agencies that have been funded by the California Healthcare Foundation to help with just making sense of Calaim. <laughs> so, um, so I would point you to their website, the California Healthcare Foundation website. Well, I looked at number four on your resource list. Oh, good. <laughs> okay, great. And I will say that um, that CSH, we will be working on fact sheets 
um, and some trainings that are, will be specifically tailored to the managed care plans. And so we'll want to be getting feedback from all of you on some of the things that you are seeing, ways that we can help um, encourage the managed care plans to really take advantage of these services and to really you know, fund them at the right level and um, so that they can hit those outcomes. And then we also are going to be offering a Medi-Cal Academy, um, several academies in 2022 and 2023 for community providers that have never worked with Medicaid before, new, you know, new to Medi-Cal, um, really walking you through the process of how you would become a Medi-Cal provider. It could be through community supports or it could be in preparation for a benefit that uh, I am hopeful that in the next few years that the state will see the evidence of you know, what it means to pay for some of these social determinants of health and then choose to incorporate them into a benefit. Thanks, Victoria. Thank you, Adria. So helpful to understand this policy rollout. Hopeful there will be awareness of the growing aging and disability resource centers in the state to enhance. Yes, yes, thank you very much. Prevention of homelessness up to now is difficult. We need to directly refer to these types of services because they do not have homelessness in their background. That's a good point, Catherine. So let me pull up the slide that shows. So you may be working with members who may not qualify for enhanced care management or um, community supports related to housing status, but they may qualify. I'm sorry, let me get to the right um, slide here. They may qualify under um, some of the other, you know, the other target populations. So I apologize, I'm trying to search around. Here we go. Um, so individuals experiencing homelessness are one group. Um, individuals who are high utilizers with frequent hospital admissions, and that's defined. Um, the state has given guidance in terms of the number of hospital admissions, and then plans have the opportunity to also decide, you know, do we need to go even more acute than that? Um, Individuals who are at risk of, for institutionalization and eligible for long-term care will be one of those populations that are rolled into enhanced care management a little bit later. And then individuals that right now are in nursing facilities who want to transition to the community. Um, individuals that have SMI um, with co-occurring chronic health conditions, they may also be eligible. Uh, again, there is that caveat around um, you know, they may be eligible if they're at risk for institutionalization. Um, but again, I, I think, you know, we'll see that as they roll out over time. So let me pull, pull up the slide that's showing this over time rollout here. Sure, I have a quick question though. Going yes. back, you know, in regards to what we're discussing right now, if you go back to the other slide, mm -hmm. you know, one of the target populations was those individuals, um, high utilizers or frequent users of hospital emergency. Could a loophole mm -hmm. work for um, people that are 62 and over because they do tend to have to go to the hospital a lot more frequent or is it like just that emergency room part? Because I'm just like, is there a loophole in that with the older population in that particular part? Yeah, so it's not, I wouldn't call it a loophole, but it could be emergency room visits. It could also be um, overnight stays, so hospital mm -hmm. admissions. Uh, yeah, so that the utilization, and let me pull this screen back up again. Um, community supports that are related to those housing transitions or medically tailored meals or recuperative care, they will have to be instead of, or more cost effective, um, is a better way of saying it, than, than another service that they would be eligible for. Um, so let's see, at the Home Safe program, um, Catherine, if you wanna come off mute too, if there's anything else that um, you're seeing that might make um, folks that you're working with eligible. But I would say if you're working with seniors that have acute 
um, needs um, are at risk of institutionalization, have multiple co-occurring chronic conditions. It could be behavioral health, substance use disorders, or medical conditions. Um, regardless of you know their housing status, they could be eligible for enhanced care management and could I, be eligible for some of those community supports. I see what you're saying. I mean, and I do have one client in particular right now that he's kind of at that high level that you're talking about and would be eligible, except he has SCAN. So we've connected him through SCAN through Great. everything possible right now. But what I'm talking about is I see, you know, as somebody who works with the 62 and over, what I see is clients who are kind of still in the prevention need of things too that could mm -hmm. benefit from being referred before they get to the multiple mm -hmm. hospitalizations and everything else because my program only lasts six months and of course they're aging in place and they're determined to stay in their homes which i'm working to keep them in the housing so that they don't fall into homelessness but typically now to get them connected to these programs they have to have that homeless for a year criteria to even yeah. connect. Yeah. So I can't even connect with these programs right now. So yeah, I would say- Or is a way to get there before it gets to critical mass. Yeah. Unfortunately, with that cost-effective piece and it focusing on the highest acuity mm -hmm. populations that preventing homelessness is not, you know, while it was originally a piece of it, those at risk of homelessness, um, you know, plans when they read that had to push back because they looked at their data of <laughs> just income levels and housing security, the, the information that they had and knew that the number of people that would be eligible for it would like, how could they make it cost effective with the rates that the state was giving? So, the um, so it really, so then the, yeah, the state changed it to removing that at again. risk. Yeah. <laughs> They, they got axed again, basically, yeah, is what yeah. you're saying. Yeah, and I'd say that in other wow. states that have added these housing, tenancy, and sustaining services and navigation services as a benefit, some have added prevention to it. So those at risk of homelessness, if they're residing in public housing or Hawaii did that for theirs, um, a few other states have included that prevention aspect, but with some parameters to keep the group small. Okay, thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Great questions. Let me bring it back to our discussion. And I'll say in the last five minutes, it's a bit of a shameless plug around some of the um, things that CSH has seen in terms of what's most helpful for our clients. Um, any time a state goes through um, a five-year innovation pilot program, what it means for the direct service providers and the clients uh, is oftentimes some confusion. <laughs> and it takes some years to ramp up and then maybe a year of services and then you're already in evaluation period and ramping down. Um, and so what CSH would recommend, what I would say, um, is you know, a Medi-Cal benefit for housing related services and for some of these social determinant of health services um, is going to be the most benefit to our members and to providers because it's the least, it's, we wouldn't be in that constant state of sort of reactive change. Um, that being said, it takes a state, especially a state as big as California, uh, a good amount of time to demonstrate to the federal government that, hey, this program will work uh, we we want you to prove it, and here's our track record for why. And so that's, you know, whole person care and health homes program, and now these community supports are continuing to build the evidence base for a benefit. And so we want to just keep that front and center um, while there's all the chaos going on that a benefit would be the most helpful to uh, Medi-Cal members. It's something then that is an entitlement. Um, if they meet the eligibility criteria, they would be eligible to receive services. Um, and some of these limitations and the variation we're seeing, you know, across plans and across counties um, would be reduced. Um, two other things that, um, you know, the state is interested in understanding how many providers around the state could provide housing related supports. Um, they have an understanding 
somewhat from the health homes program, what we've learned and from whole person care um, and then other coordination efforts. Um, but really th they're looking to conduct an independent evaluation across the state of provider capacity. So that's something that in the next year you may see emails about. We would love to um, include you in um, if CSH is involved in that in any way or to promote it. Um, and then the, the middle bullet point is really around the importance of all of us advocating for what is the total cost, the true cost of providing high quality services at the caseload sizes that we need to really help, help people get housed and stay housed. And then um, what, what do we need in terms of a provider community, in terms of capacity for uh, data sharing, for technology, for being compliant with HIPAA, for any new staff trainings, for staff hiring bonuses <laughs> to stay competitive. Um, so what are all those startup costs and can the state provide grants um, to help cover some of these costs? And last shout out is gonna just go to some of these resources. Um, I relied heavily on many of these webinars to make sure I had the right information for you. And we're gonna just keep adding to this resource list. Um, and again, I do wanna encourage you to check out um, the, the recent, um, the Ensuring the Uninsured Project did a webinar that was talking about the transitions from whole person care to enhanced care management that I think will be really important for those of you that have clients who are on whole person care and then also pointing you to this, Calling explained um, the overview of the new programs and key changes from the California Health Care Foundation will be really important as well. Thank you so much for your time today, for your participation in the chat. Um, keep questions coming. I'm gonna put my email in the chat so that you can reach out directly if you have questions. And uh, Gretchen has uploaded, it looks like the evaluation form. So would love to hear your um, feedback on this session. Gretchen, I'll hand it back to you. Well, thank you so much, um, Cheryl, for making a somewhat complex topic understandable and for all your expertise and knowledge on this uh, important uh, upcoming program. So um, we look forward to getting your evaluations back. And um, if you do have any further questions, you know, feel free to email us. I also wanted to give a little shout out to Holly for getting this all organized and helping us uh, make it a good session. So thank you everyone. Have a happy holidays. Thank you all. Take care.